This is Toledo Symphony Lab, a behind-the-scenes look at the world of classical music from WGTE Public Media and your Toledo Symphony. I'm Brad Cresswell. Joining me today in the studio are the Toledo Symphony's president and CEO, Zach Vassar, principal second violin and artistic administrator, Merwin Sue, and the TSO's music director, Elaine Trudell. Also joining us by phone, we have a very special guest, and I've got a fanfare ready. Here we go. Please welcome our guest, mezzo-soprano Susan Platts, who joins us by phone. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Hi. Did you enjoy that little fanfare we had for you? It was beautiful. Thank you. Well, you know, we like to welcome all of our guests with a little musical tribute. Speaking of musical tributes, you are in town to sing the music of Gustav Mahler, not just any Mahler piece, this wonderful sort of symphony and song called... Das Lied von der Erde, or the Song of the Earth. This is happening uh, Friday and Saturday. It's November 19th and 20th, 8 o'clock p.m. at the Toledo Museum of Art Peristyle. People can find more information about this at the website, toledosymphony.com. And uh, they can call the box office, 419-246-8000. Okay, Susan, now that we got that out of the way, welcome back to Toledo. You were here before, yeah? I was. I was there a couple of years ago uh, performing more music of Mahler, uh, his second symphony, and I'm super excited to be back to perform Das Lied von der Erde, which is definitely one of my favorite pieces of his. That's wonderful. Now i got to catch up on Mahler here because... Thank you for that. Every time we say the word Mahler, <laughs> we play this Mahler bell. I don't know where we got the idea of the Mahler well, bell. Well, it's like, it's like Ma Bell, the same thing. <laughs> exactly, yep. Ma Bell, Ma <laughs> Bell. And, and the reason being that, you know, for some reason, you know, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. Zach always manages to, to get the conversation somehow pointed towards Mahler. So, Zach, you must be, uh, you know in heaven right now because we're actually talking about Mahler today. Well, talking about Mahler and being in heaven are basically the same thing. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I have no idea who this Mahler guy is. I just noticed that whenever I say his name, you guys ring a bell. So it's like a Pavlovian response at this point. Yeah. Well, we don't want to ring the bell the entire podcast, but we'll, we'll So we'll, we'll just call it. him Voldemort? What do we, what do, we do? How yeah, do we do this? We'll, yeah. we'll, just, we'll just, you know, we'll be conservative with we call the him ringing of the bell. Gus? Yeah, Gus. something like Good. that. Done. Okay. Susan, let me ask you, uh, what we normally do when we have a special guest is ask them to tell us their story. So maybe you can talk about, you know, how you got into singing, becoming a singer, and this whole thing with Gustav Mahler's music, because you're, you're closely identified with the music of Mahler. You know, how did that happen? Let me pull up a little music for you first here. We have a choice. We can do the... This one, which is Childhood de uh, Dreams or Childhood Nightmares. Or no, I'm sorry, Childhood Adventures, right? <laughs> childhood Adventures. <laughs> I know. Those are very different that's things. That's one. I'm yeah. going to go with the dreams. <laughs> which one? The dreams. Let's go with the dreams. Yeah, I can't imagine why you would okay. make that choice. Yeah. We'll go back. We'll cut this all out later or not. Here <laughs> okay. we go. Cut it out, Brad. All right. <laughs> childhood uh, Dreams. I... Yeah, I, I was actually late to music. I thought I was going to go into graphic design when I was in sort of my teens. I loved art and um, was in choir in high school, and my choir teacher told me I had a pretty voice. And I convinced my mom to uh, have let me have some uh, singing lessons. And sort of the story goes on from there that I just, I loved music and I started uh, singing some of Mahler's Leader, and then when I was in my early 20s uh, in Victoria, British Columbia, the orchestra was going to perform Mahler's Second Symphony, and they asked me if I would be the alto soloist, and I was listening to the symphony one day just to see if it was something that I felt would be good for my voice, I could do, and just fell in love with his music and um there's sort of been no looking back i just i just adore his music it fits my voice my personality and i feel extremely lucky that the majority of my career has been performing his music so it's uh, makes me very happy that's wonderful let me bring yeah. in a little Yay! <laughs> 
<laughs> applause for that story. You know what I want to do now is take a quick break and uh, see if we can do the first part of our quiz. I mentioned to you, Susan, uh, before we started the podcast that I, I usually do a quiz during each of these episodes. So today's quiz is um, a literary type quiz. Now, we haven't talked about the history of Das Lied von der Erde yet, but the texts come from various uh, Chinese poets, right? Mm -hmm. Elaine, you can you can chime in here. And uh, among one of the, the poets that is used in this text, in German translation, I should say, is uh, the poet Li Bai, who lived during the 8th century mm -hmm. um, in China. So here's the quiz. This is a, a who wrote it quiz, right? So I'm going to read a quote to you, and you tell me if it was written by Li Bai oh. or by Confucius, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Confucius lived about 1,200 years before Li Bai, but, or Li Po, as I always knew him, actually. <laughs> Um, but they they wrote some similar um, quotes, so it'll be kind of fun to go through this. I'm so, going to do four at a time, right? So, Brad, are, are we supposed to announce our guesses, or are we supposed to write oh, yeah. them down and then tell you them at the end? Well, you, you wait, and then you can tell me at the end. Oh, right? Can we have buzzers? Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're going to have, absolutely, we'll have buzzers. That means no. <laughs> that means yes. Okay? So... But what I'm going to do is I'm going to read four quotes, and you have to decide if they're Li Bai or Confucius, okay? Okay. Everybody got something to write with? Susan, maybe, I don't know if you have something to write with there, but maybe you can remember. You're oh, a singer. Okay. You, can, you can do this. Okay. Let me pull up a little music. This is actually uh, a well-known um, melody from Beijing Opera. Sort of set the tone in the background there. All right. Quote number one, he who neglects to drink of the spring of experience is likely to die in the desert of ignorance. Okay, that one's a little complicated. Is that Levi or Confucius? Okay, it's second one. If you think in terms of a year, plant a seed. If in terms of 10 years, plant trees. If in terms of 100 years, teach the people. Okay. Quote number three, we have two lives, and the second begins when we realize we only have one. It's a little confusing, but it makes sense if you think about it. And the final one is, gods have bestowed our genius on us. They will also find its use someday. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Zach is... I'm just over here flipping a coin. Zach is, <laughs> Zach is basically giving up. Okay. Well, let's go through uh, uh, Let's go through these four. Are we doing the answers now? Yeah, we're going to do the answers now. I'm that just doesn't give me nearly enough time to go on I, my phone and oh, find out Oh, my phone's getting out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. All it's right. far too early for a quiz like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some educated guesses. Okay, number one. Well, we're going to let you answer these, okay, oh, Susan? Oh, 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 wow. Boy. Number Back one. He, the he, there, didn't I? he who neglects to... I promise these quotes get better. He who <laughs> neglects to drink of the spring of experience is likely to die of thirst in the desert of ignorance. What do you say, I'm, Susan? I'm going to say Lee Bai for that one. Uh -huh. Yay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, it was Mahler. Yeah, that is, that is Levi. Well done. Second one. If you think in terms of a year, plant a seed. In terms of 10 years, plant trees. In terms of 100 years, teach the people. Who would that be? That just sounds like Confucius to me. Yay! Oh, wow. You're cleaning I, I can up happily here. pass off the next two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have two lives, and the second begins when we realize we only have one. What do you say, Elaine? Levi. Mm. Oh, no. <laughs> that was we actually Confucius. Answer. Yeah. The same and the final one, gods have bestowed our genius on us. They will also find its use someday. What do you say, Zach? I'm going with Levi. Yay! Excellent. So did anybody get all four of those? No? No. Susan, you didn't? I was going to have Confucius for the third, but I, I think I would have said Confucius for the last one, too. Okay. So did anybody get three of them? Susan, you got three, Maybe. Right? <laughs> Anybody else? No? I okay, we'll ten. give that round to Susan. <laughs> oh, 
Oh dear, are there, is there more than one round? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're just getting started. There are a few oh, more okay. rounds here, but let's get back to Mahler, right? Okay. So we can talk about Das Lied von der Erde, or the Song of the Earth. It's a it's such a wonderful piece. And Elaine, why don't you give us, uh, you know, sort of from the conductor's viewpoint, mm-hmm. uh, a, a little knowledge about this well, this speaking, particular work? Speaking of rounds, I mean the the, the first mm-hmm. movement of Das Lied. <laughs> He's paying for the first round, but yeah. uh, <laughs> but to go back, uh, actually, I give you some context. I think that's probably the most important thing about this piece is that. You bring yourself back to a certain moment. It was uh, uh, 1907, and Mahler was like the you know king of the world. I mean, he had the he had a nice family. He had the, he had the girl. He had the job. He was the music director and uh, of Vienna State Opera. And then within that year, he likes the, the and if you if you look at what he says, he says he's been hit three times by the faith and uh, destiny and uh first of all uh he uh, there's a rumblings everywhere and as his job at the opera house because he was a bit of a we can say it you know he was a bit of a tyrant and because he, he wanted to bring back the operas like they were supposed to be because if we bring ourselves back to that time basically the the the, the big star singers could do whatever they want in an opera including adding Arias from another opera because it was a great hit for them and yeah. you would have like a very dramatic opera and they said well I'm going to sing one of my hits there and then I break into something then I'll come back and he was he said no we have to bring it back so anyway he didn't only make friends in his job by trying to do that so there were grumblings and they finally got rid of him and and then in the same year is uh is one of his daughter uh dies so the and then in the same year also uh, the he, the doctor tells him he has a very uh uh, a very bad heart condition that actually is years are counted. So bang, bang, bang goes from one extreme to the other. Yeah, and then he, he reconsiders his life basically, you know. And that's not talking about his marital problems because, uh, you know, the well the thing is that you know if you marry somebody who's uh, who's who has a very big personality in their own right, you cannot suppress that, you know, and which is yeah. a very wrong thing to do. Which what he did with Alma with his wife, who was actually a very very good composer. Her own, her own right. She mm-hmm. didn't. She didn't write a lot of music because he said there's only one place for one genius in this family. I mean, yeah. you know, and I, he, he was he was a tough guy, and uh, and and then you know she started like uh, you know they, it, it, it didn't go very well after that. So I, Mahler, I don't imagine it would go very yeah, well. <laughs> no, that. exactly. You know, and yeah. so so I'm putting all this context then to show us where where the the person is like in his life or where he is. He's and and he he did all this big uh, overcompensating to win his wife back by writing the eighth symphony with a thousand performers and throw oh, to impress her a little bit you know <laughs> so uh, my symphony's bigger than yours and uh, <laughs> 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 wow and and then he gets into that zone where he's writing some of his last music because he wrote the eighth symphony so now he's going to write his ninth and he doesn't want to write his ninth because now he's he wasn't a super super a superstitious guy but with everything that happened to him in the last two years he felt like well i'm not going to write like a ninth symphony on top of that because then i'm gonna die because you know beethoven right. and every, i yeah. mean I, no, nobody gets a schubert ever so he thought i'm gonna trick i'm gonna trick destiny i'm gonna write a symphony of songs symphony of songs you know of leads and uh i and so he writes this wonderful das lied von der erde and these are you know you can think the songs of the earth but it's always we get into that zone where he's starting to say goodbye but he right. is he ready there's a whole all that's always the thing with Mahler. Since he was very young, he was very close to people dying in his family and mm-hmm. his colleagues. And, and he's always had that sense of mortality and the sense of that everything will end at some point. It's also very much fin de siècle in Vienna. Mm-hmm. You know, Vienna, Paris, uh, the end of the 19th century, beginning of 20th century. So uh, everybody's in the zone like, oh, well, the world as we know it is ending. And it's actually true in a way. Yeah. But uh, it, so is general general disposition was around that so when he writes music that's around saying goodbye especially in the that that's uh, von der Erde. by the way he did write a ninth after and he said ah ha ha I got it so he started the tenth and then he died so that, that's so much for him <laughs> <laughs> so we needed uh, we needed Shostakovich to come around and fix that later on but uh, yeah. that he wrote 15 right so okay. 
So basically, Mahler is setting us up with a way of looking back at things, or looking not necessarily back at his life, but looking at nature, looking at the way people are, and he finds this inspiration in, the, as you said, poems that are like hundreds of years before him, and they they talk a lot about uh, about a few things, like the beginning, the first movement is just basically a guy saying, oh, we're all going to have a drink, we're going to get drunk, it's going to be funny, but before, let me tell you the story. I have a story, and everybody you know, puts their cup down, and says, come on, tell your story, we want a drink, you know? Yeah. And he said, well, I will tell you a story of how life is tough and horrible, so let's have a drink. Life is dark, <laughs> death is dark, you you know? It's like the beginning <laughs> of the tales of Hoffman. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. So you have this, this first movement, and then you go into that second movement, which, uh, you know, talks a lot about loneliness, which is the first time we hear the the contralto in this uh, in this uh, symphony of songs, and it reminds us a lot from the Kindertoten leader, which is was the song he was writing, song of dead children that he was writing. Yeah. That his wife said, "Stop writing this; something bad's gonna happen." And his daughter died. I mean, how can you not become superstitious after that? Wow! And and it brings us back to that kind of uh, loneliness, and also the orchestration is very, very. There's very few instruments, very yeah. chamber music like, uh, and then we get into three movements that are after that you know of um, of beauty of youth or maybe I got them right and another drinking song and they're kind of a, a unit the three of them together that makes things lighter before we get into the Abshid the, the farewell which is the one of the I'd mm. say the greatest work of art ever produced I and, mean, and uh, that's sung by Susan that right? will be sung by Susan and you know if you have to pick somebody in the world to sing that and you get Susan Platz you get the best person to sing it so oh, wow. I mean, people in Toledo and people all over are going to be watching this. That no, no pressure, Susan. They're, yeah. they're, 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 no, but they're, they're in for. Well, not for her. It's not that way because she lives smaller. She yeah. doesn't. She doesn't produce Mahler. She lives Mahler. So it's the yeah. uh, same for us when we play. So it's not a question. Uh, Mahler is above all of that. Uh, pre, you know, uh, performance and uh, you know, uh, it's it's just about it's about life. It's like having a discussion about life, about yeah. saying farewell to to life, but going into another place. You know, you're sad but you're happy at the same time. It's a very very. Uh, it's what life is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We all Yay! Think that. So, in a nutshell, <laughs> that's that's lead for me. I, I want to say that the tenor can't sing Abshid ever because he's been drinking <laughs> way too much previous. <laughs> that's why I got it. I was Such the a guy. one not drinking at all. He, yeah. he also had to sing the first movement, which Mahler said, I'm going to butcher him there. You can see he didn't like tenors from yeah. that first, the writing in that first yeah. movement. You know, I used to <laughs> sing this a long time ago. I sang it a few different times, and I never once got it right. But, <laughs> but I always got the side eye from the mezzo, you know. Every time you were singing, they were like, Always looking at you like, did they do a little research on this drinking song before they, <laughs> <laughs> before they uh, sang it today? That sort of thing. I always do feel bad for the tenor though, because he, yeah, the the first movement is awkward, and then yes. there's that that third movement, which is so short, it's just like a little, um, you know, yeah. a little That's additional. A, it's a wink. Toast. Yeah, it's a wink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but but like Elaine says, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world oh, to no. sing. Yeah, but the mezzo gets all the good stuff. You I mean, know that last time Susan and I did this together, the tenor bailed at the last minute. We had to get a tenor. I don't know if you remember. It was an Ottawa. Oh, that's right. I do. And, and, yeah. and thanks guy for the came phone in. call. Yeah, oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the guy came in. Of course, we, we got somebody who was young. We didn't know what he was getting into because wait, wait, no, you nobody got would somebody say yes. who was young. Yeah, and okay. Drunk. Well, and that's <laughs> why you didn't call me. Oh, I, I was only drunk. I wasn't young. So. Well, watch it. I'm gonna call you next. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you have to. Now we know you've done. It. Yeah, it's exactly. too late now. <laughs> too late now. Uh, Susan, I mean, we we heard Elaine sort of give accolades to you and your art. Why don't you talk a little bit about the times that you've worked with Elaine? Because you have both um, made some of this music together in the past. We have. We've. Uh, well, I mean, on top of the the Mahler Second that we performed in Toledo, we performed this together in Ottawa, I believe it was, yep. and uh, it's. It was a wonderful experience, and there's something just very comforting when you go back to the same piece with the same conductor that went so well the first time, you, you're you pretty certain it's going to be a wonderful experience again, and also just room to grow. We've, we've lived that many more years of our lives since we last performed it, and uh, one of the things with Mahler's music that I love is that 
as we grow and we experience life and its happinesses and its sadnesses, uh, we grow. It grows with us. So every time I come back to his music, it just, it, I'm at a different point in my life and Alain will be with his life and it will, there will be similarities, but there'll be differences too. You know, we, you grow with music and with life. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yay! So. I got a little chill on that one. I'm sorry, guys. I have to say that was really beautifully said. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm a little envious that you get to fly around and perform these beautiful works and get that review preview uh, moment back through my yeah. Well done. Well, it's it's funny because I I feel lucky that I, I have been doing this for a long time now, and I, I've sung Mahler's works for a long time. and. Um, I'm not dropping a name here when I say this, but I was lucky enough early on in my career to work with Christa Ludwig, who yeah. recently passed away. And I worked on Das Lied von der Erde with her. Mm. And I remember sitting down. I was in my early 20s when I, I went to work with her, and we were at her home in the south of France. And we started to work on Das Lied, and we'd been working for about 15 minutes. And she stopped and just looked at me, and she said, I'm so envious of you. And I looked at her, and there's me, this young little gift going, Krista Ludwig, world famous soprano, is envious of me, and how is that so? And she just looked at me, and she said, you can sing this now, and I can't sing this anymore. And I just, that was a chills for me moment, and something I've never forgotten, and so I appreciate each performance Mm. that I have and chance that I have to... Uh, sing this this wonderful music. Yeah, and we're not talking about this music right here. This is not smaller. <laughs> yeah. I, I brought this up because I wanted to go to the next part of our quiz. And then you mentioned Krista Ludwig. Yeah. I had the pleasure of, of uh, singing a small role with her in Boston. Oh, fantastic. And I remember after the performance, she came off stage and touched me on the nose and said, Schön, which means, you know, pretty <laughs> in, in yeah. German. And it was like being knighted by the <laughs> by the queen, you know. It was. I, yeah. I can imagine what that experience was like for you. Yeah, it was. It was fantastic. I, I was just listening to her recording with uh, Bernstein and the Israel Philharmonic on the way mm. into this recording oh. session. Uh, it's one of the dust leads that I, I, I turned to. And yeah. yeah. It's just so beautifully done. Yeah. So, I'm happy that she's in your heart as you think about yeah, this music, she is. too. Yeah, and well, I still have her markings in my Mahler scores, and I <laughs> just I just leave them in there, and when I open them up, and I, I recently sang a, a Rukert leader, and I, there I see Chris's handwriting, and there are little notes, and it's just, yeah, it'll always be there. It's very touching. Susan, I would love to hear you in the Rukert leader. I do love it. Maybe next time. <laughs> next time. Like, I have to tell people every so often, I sing to other composers, but... For, I mean, I just feel so lucky and so happy that this really has been like his music, the cornerstone of my career for sure. For yeah. for the people who might not know who Christa Ludwig is, right? It's if you want to do an analogy, it's like uh, having uh, Babe Ruth putting your hands on the band and say, "Well, it goes a little bit that way," you know. Uh-huh. And 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 then and then you go on and you go and you you bat all these uh, wonderful home runs, but that's it's that legendary because she did it with uh, of course it's our, in our work it's word of mouth a lot, and yeah. so you go back to Christa Ludwig, you go about Bruno Walter and directly to Mahler, mm-hmm. so that's yeah. it. It's like a direct line. Yeah, you know. Well, we ran out of quiz music, so <laughs> <laughs> that means we don't have to do the second round. No, we're going to do the second round. I want to make a no no Nanette uh, Hang on. joke here, but I can't. Hang on, I'm going to bring it back. Here we go, round two of our quiz. Ready? Four questions. You tell me if it's Confucius or Li Bai. Oh, boy. <laughs> a lion chased me up a tree, and I greatly enjoyed the view from the top. <laughs> okay. Is that a lion or a lion? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> a lion. A lion tra- chased me up a tree. I greatly appreciated the view. <laughs> I'm actually going to change that here. Yeah. Uh, Let me write that that down. Okay, second one. When you see a good person, think of becoming like them. When you see someone not so good, reflect on your own weak points. See, that had nothing to do with Elaine. (laughs) All right. Now, one brief journey betwixt heaven and earth. Then, alas, we are the same old dust of 10,000 ages. Okay. 
if you are the smartest person in the room, then you are in the wrong room. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. So those are your four quotes. Wow. Those are your four sayings, okay? So let's run right through them. And, and Susan, tell me if you got the first one. Elaine chased you up a tree, and you greatly enjoyed the view from the top. I would say uh, Confucius. Yay! Got that one. When you see a good person, think of becoming like them. When you see someone not so good, reflect on your own weak points. What do you say, Susan? It sounds so Confucius-y. Yay! Yeah. confucius Can we make that a word? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> one brief journey betwixt heaven and earth, and alas, we are the same old dust of 10,000 ages. Susan, I'll let you answer that one. Let's go with Lee by just to be different. Okay, and finally, if you are the smartest person in the room, then you are in the wrong room. What do you say, you, Susan? You realize if I get this, I have to leave the room, right? <laughs> <laughs> wow, what an interesting challenge. Um, I honestly, I'm going to say Confucius. Yay! Yay. Wow, clean well sweep. done. That was impressive. Yes. Did anybody else get all four? Yeah. Elaine got all four? Yeah. All right, good we for you, Elaine. We can all say them. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! Did someone say Mahler? <laughs> <laughs> we ring the bell. Now now we've got it to where we ring the bell and you say Mahler, right? <laughs> so that's it's perfect. You rang. So, uh, Susan, I want I want to talk a little bit more about um your career. You mentioned you, you mentioned Krista Ludwig being a, a great influence on you. I know that you worked also with uh, Jesse Norman, who passed away uh, a year or so ago. Can, can you talk a little bit about that relationship? Yeah, that's also been a huge, um, just wonderful part of my career. I got to work with her through a program that Rolex have called the Rolex Mentor and Protégé Arts Initiative, and they enabled me to work with Jesse Norman for a year, um, and we did, but we we were became friends and we enjoyed our time working together, and so up until when she passed away, we remained in contact, and then I would go and see her to either sing some new music I was learning or just sit and have a cup of tea with her and talk about life and I I learned a lot from her um, and that experience to have a voice like hers I mean she is a legend and to be yeah. in a room and sit you know like 10, 15 feet away from her and sing for her and then have her sort of stop you and say, no, 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 it, it, try it like this. And then she demonstrates. And I would just watch her and be like, what, do you have like a sound system in there? Like her, <laughs> her voice just resonated. And yeah. she just had this presence. And yet if you were, if you were a friend, if you were, you know, trusted by her. She she gave you so much. She would share so much with you about her career and wanted to be there when when you needed her. I, I still remember being on a... Uh, I've only in my whole career ever been let go once from a job where the conductor situation, the I just wasn't right in his mind for the piece that I'd been hired for. Elaine, he, why did you do that? No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> Just kidding. I never. It's funny because you don't talk about these, you know, it's hard to talk about things because nobody ever wants to like get, get let go from a job. But for me, it was um, heartening because uh, I was in Holland and I wrote to Jesse because it was a it was a tour and we had six concerts and it was after the fourth one that the conductor said I, I think I'm going to replace you for the last two Eesh. and I'd been singing well I just wasn't what he wanted for mm. for the music mm. and that's fine he'd hired me from he'd heard me singing Mahler <sighs> anyway long story short I I reached out to Jesse and I said I'm I'm here I'm in Holland I I'm devastated this has never happened before I just I felt awful and she like literally responded to me in in about 10 minutes and she said call me let's talk and she just made me feel so much better yeah. and she was so funny she said 
what do you want? Can I do anything to help? She said, should I be calling this conductor? (laughs) (laughs) And for a moment flashed through my mind, Jesse Norman picking up the phone, (laughs) the conductor answering, and her saying, this is Jesse Norman. Right. What do you think you're doing? And, and you should have moment, done that and, and like impersonated her, right? <laughs> I could have. But that moment flashing in front of me, it just made me feel like I could go forward. Like mm, yeah. I, it was a devastating experience to happen. But So she was there not only to teach me how to be a better singer, but she gave me so much insight into just the career and the ups and downs that you do and can face. Mm. Um, and I just feel so lucky to have been able to work for with her and also fe- feel like I can call her a friend as well. Yeah. Well, you've had some remarkable experiences throughout your career working with legendary singers, you know, who have served in a me- mentorship role to you do you teach or work with younger uh, singers yourself or do you have advice for young folks who want to get into opera especially in the wake of the pandemic i mean it's been really hard for people to try to to break into the business yeah. over the past year what what are your thoughts on on that sort of thing yeah i i totally agree um i think i i teach a little bit more like master classes every so often. I, I don't have any students that I see on a regular basis. Um, yeah, it's definitely been an interesting and tough and almost life reevaluating time through this pandemic. But I think my advice to young singers, musicians is life goes on and and we have to find a way forward. I mean, throughout my career, I remember um, around 2006, 2005, so much was going on, and it just seemed like such a rich, fruitful time. And then the financial collapse happened, and I remember so many orchestras struggled so much, and I definitely felt the effect of co- canceled concerts and just a kind of resetting of things. But Gradually, over time, things recovered, and it's a bit like the end of Das Lied. The earth blooms again each year, and life goes on. So even though this is a very tough time to be going through for a young singer or for a seasoned singer like myself, life goes on, and we, we, will, we will come out from this so don't give up if this is your passion if this is your your dream we have to um keep going and jesse said to me once she said you know life always throws us curveballs and she said don't dodge them you just have to figure out how to deal with them yeah great advice definitely well i i want to switch gears here a little bit and talk with you about your as you call it your pandemic project you wrote a cookbook with a great title. You want to tell us about that? I, I okay, yes. I I quickly realized early on after, you know, absolutely like every other performer just every single concert was canceled and then I'd get the thought of another concert and that would then get canceled and I needed something and I like so many people. I I love I love baking and um, so I decided just to gather all of my recipes from over life and put them in one place. And then I thought, well, why don't I write a little dessert cookbook? And it was a great project and my husband took all the photos for it and I was born in England. I grew up in Canada. And now I live in the US. So it's um, sort of a little little journey of recipes from my life, you know, a lot of British recipes because they were a big part of my, my growing up. And it's called Are You Ready for Dessert? A Musician mm-hmm. Takes Center Stage in the Kitchen. Let, let's and just make clear, aria, like like yeah, opera aria. aria. Yeah, like are you aria. ready for dessert, yeah. right? Okay. Okay, yeah. Because when we were, my sister actually came up with that title, and, and I love it, yeah. but loving I have to tell this story because we're we're this is a show about Mahler um, <laughs> when I was going through various uh, options for titles my husband one day he I can still see him standing in the kitchen and he goes okay I've got a title <laughs> what about the song of dessert 
And so he was like, you know, the song of the year, the song of dessert. And I was like, oh, my God, I love it. And just total nerdiness. Mm. And, you know, I soon learned after telling a few people about it, that tell, saying the title and there was a sort of a blank look and then you have to explain it all and I'm like <laughs> maybe this isn't the right title um, yeah. there are a couple laws of branding yeah. Mahler yeah. you ready for dessert <laughs> yeah, Ma- Mara, wait, that's, that's another one there you go um, I like but das, I, das Nied van der Erde <laughs> <laughs> okay that's a good one too Oh, well, it's too late. It's Lord. on the print now. I, I can't. Yeah, I'm sure See, ready for dessert. She's thinking, you know, where were you guys when, when we were coming up with titles? Butter right, Toten exactly. Leader. Exactly. Butter Toten Leader. <laughs> okay, you have to go out in the hallway, Zach. <laughs> so this cookbook is being published as we speak. Give us a, tell us some of the stuff that's in there. Like, like you know, you got okay. any good chocolate recipes in there? I do. Okay, so along with a lot of British classics like sticky toffee pudding and Battenberg and Mm. um, Bakewell tart, I came up with a dessert, and I've called it a Mahlerwürfel. Now, okay, I have to explain the background, which I do in the book. Um, A few years ago, my husband and I did a very nerdy Mahler tour to Europe, and we traveled around all of the composing huts where <sighs> Mahler composed his music. That and we not started our tour in Salzburg, and somebody had said to us, when you're there, all the shops have uh, Mozart Kugeln, don't have the Mozart Kugeln, go to this specific cafe and have something called a Bach Würfel. And Würfel translates to cube. So it was this little cube of yum. It was a layer of marzipan and a sort of chocolate ganache and a liqueur ganache covered in chocolate. And it was heavenly. So when I came home, you can only get them in Austria. So when I came home, I tried to recreate this little dessert that we'd had. And I did something that I was pretty happy with. And so then when I wrote the cookbook, I wanted to include it, and I thought, well, I can't call it a box Würfel because that's already taken, and I love Mahler's music, so I'll call it a Mahler Würfel, and I added to it a layer of jam, because apparently Mahler really liked his jam, and he would have like a different flavor every day or something, so um, that's one of my, my proud moments. But then somebody pointed out to me, ironically, Würfel is spelled... W U R F E L, and of course there's Alma. Uh, I was Verful. Uh. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I didn't name it Verful, but it's Verful. So anyway, Verful, that's my Verful. Mahler story. I was, <laughs> was going to make that joke. I thought that's it might be marvelous. I'm all over Mahler. I can't even say. It. If anybody got any more Mahler. puns on Mahler, Mahler. I want to Mahler hear Mahler Merlade. You could call. Oh, there we go. Mahler Merlade. That would be Mahler not Mar- Ma- jam, oh, there it is. but Mahler Merlade. Oh. Yes. Mahler Merlade. <laughs> Can I just say that I I like best of all a little cube of yum. I'm gonna yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Use that it in really the future. Is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Well, that sounds delicious. We can't wait to try that out. Because, you know, Mahler was always known for his miniatures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what we, we're not. What we need to do is have like a Mahler uh, tasting party, yeah. right? Where you're tasting with your ears and your mouth. Oh, and so yeah. So we have all of these little Mahler, Kugel, Verful, whatever they are. But it would all be bittersweet, no? <laughs> uh, it <laughs> is actually like bittersweet that. chocolate. Yes, Alain, you're right. You get yeah. a bell. Yeah. <laughs> and with with um, a I chamber I thought concert, that I would right? bring some when I come, so I'll bring some little boxes. Okay. Oh, around. you should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely, at least four of them for the yep. four of us in the studio here. Oh my gosh! Let's do one more round of our quiz, okay? Oh, Let me switch up the music here and get back. I'm not in the hot seat for this one, okay? Well, you're in the lead, right? But we'll, we'll put we'll put somebody else in the hot seat, okay? Here they are. To be wronged is nothing unless you continue to remember it, okay? Second one: We sit together, the mountain and me. Until only the mountain remains. Next one is shade and light are different in every valley. And finally, never give a sword to a man who can't dance. All right. 
So let's go back. We'll just go around the table here. To be wronged is nothing unless you continue to remember it. Let's hear from you, Marwan. You, you haven't spoken very much during this podcast. It's okay. I think having the brass players and the singers speak in Mahler is entirely appropriate. <laughs> okay, so what's your guess? To be I'll wrong be Confucius is... for the first one. Yay! All right, Marwan gets it. We sit together, the mountain and me, until only the mountain remains. What do you say, Elaine? Uh, Levi. Say again? Levi. Yeah, I scared you for a second there. Tension there, yeah. yeah. All right. Here you go, Zach. Shade and light are different in every valley. Confucius. <laughs> oh, no. That was Levi. Okay. Last one. Never give a sword to a man who can't dance. Zach will give you another shot. Confucius. Yay! Okay. Yay! Well, we know Zach missed one of them in there. Did anybody get all four? Yeah, I did. Elaine yeah. and Merwin got all four. How'd you do, Susan? No, I didn't get all four, no. Did you get three? Uh, I definitely got two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well said. So, it, it, so not a waltz. Yeah, first round was won by Susan. Second round was a tie between Susan and Elaine. Third round was a tie between Elaine and Merwin. So I'm going to call Elaine the big oh, winner yeah. here. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, it had to job. happen someday. <laughs> it had to happen. <laughs> Elaine actually beat Merwin at the quiz, and, wow. and Merwin has uh, hardly even spoken. Yeah. Let, let me turn the table over to you, Merwin. you have anything that, now that we have Susan on the phone, that you want to ask about uh, her performance upcoming? Well, actually, I, I'm fa- one thing that fascinated me is I think when we kind of talk about the way that we kind of came to Mahler, um, you know, as an instrumentalist, so many of us come to Mahler through his symphonies. And it fascinated me that your first exposure to Mahler was actually through his leader. And I wanted to kind of maybe delve a little bit deeper into that, because I think that's something that's maybe less of a common entry point into Mahler. Because, again, I always think of him as a symphonist, but he's just an amazing songwriter. Yeah, he is. And I remember, yeah, I mean, in my, I don't know, late teens, just his leader, like Hans und Greta and Erinnerung and his, the songs of his Deskanab and Wunderhorn and just, just, there is a, there is a, another world. It's not a Schubert world. It's not hundreds upon hundreds of songs, but his leader that he wrote are, they're, they're wonderful. And, and again, you know, these are, um, pieces that you hear in, in recitals and not with orchestra, um, but they're wonderful and and they're wonderful for for young singers to 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 work on as well. And they definitely sparked an interest and which then led to the uh, second symphony introduction. And um, yeah, like I said earlier, no looking back. So. Mm-hmm. If you haven't listened to his leader, do do get a chance to you know try and do that. They are wonderful. Yeah, Susan, let me ask you, you. You do so much singing of concert material, right? Where you go and you sing in a concert, as it were, like you're doing with the smaller symphony, and you do with the the other Mahler symphony. Um, how is that for you versus like singing an opera role? I mean, what what's the the big difference there? Yeah, I, I think for me, I mean. My career has mainly been uh, concert rep, was, you know, concerts with orchestras. I've done a handful of operas here and there, uh, but the difference is, you know, in an opera, you have a character, you have your costume. When you get on that stage, you're that character. And when you stand on stage in front of an orchestra for, a, say, a Das Lied von der Erde, uh, you are, you're, I am me, I'm Susan, and I am telling this story to the audience. This story that is, is Mahler's, well, somebody else's text through Mahler's then interpretation into music, and now I have the, uh, chance to, share this with the audience. For me, I like the directness of that. I like that connection to the audience that I am sort of the storyteller direct. I'm I'm not running around in a costume and uh, talking, singing with other characters. 
Not that there's anything wrong with that. Nothing at all. It's a fantastic art form. I love it. But I I like that direct kind of uh, link that I have to the audience. Um, and it's just what I know. It's what I know. I mean, again, I, I sometimes wonder if Mahler had written a bunch of operas, would I sing a lot more opera? I don't know. We'll never know that. Mm. Um, and ironically, he conducted so much opera. Um, but yeah, so so for me, it's it's that sort of direct contact with the audience uh, when you're in front of an orchestra singing. Well, we look forward to having you here. I know we're going to have to wrap it up. Does anybody have anything else they want to add to this? I'll just say, I remember uh, sneaking into one of the Mahler II rehearsals back in 2019, and I had heard so much about your voice, Susan, from Alain, and um, I was so excited um, just to hear you sing. And there was a point when... Um, as you inhaled to begin singing, um, it, 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 it gave a hint of the quality and characteristic of your voice, which is outstanding. Mm. And I said, I could listen to you inhale <laughs> for the rest of time. <laughs> and uh, it might be one of the stranger things that I've, I've said, but uh, <laughs> just, I... Just don't yeah. run for president. Just don't run for president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm just so pleased to uh, have you back on the Toledo stage. Yeah. I'm so excited and this piece definitely as much as I love the second symphony and it's gorgeous this piece is I mean it's just so different because there is so much for me to sing and it's it's a journey for everybody Mm -hmm. and I'm just really really excited to be back in Toledo and to perform this piece again with Alain and with the orchestra and um, yeah makes me very happy Well, we're excited to have you back. And for folks who don't know, that's happening Friday and Saturday, 8 p.m. at the Toledo Museum of Art Paris style. Das Lied von der Erde, The Song of the Earth by Gustav Mahler. Elaine Trudell at the podium with the Toledo Symphony. We'll also hear tenor Brandon Scott Russell along with mezzo Susan Platz, who's been our special guest here on Symphony Lab. Susan, we look forward to having you, and thank you so much for uh, sharing with us today, giving us a little backstage pass to uh, all the malarian goings-on that are happening soon. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. This program is a production of WGTE Public Media in collaboration with our sponsor, the Toledo Symphony, with generous support from the Rita Barber Kern Foundation. You can download episodes of our program as a podcast by going to our website at wgte.org lab. You can also subscribe to us through your podcast app of choice, including Apple and Google Podcasts. Remember, you can check out all the upcoming events at the Symphony by visiting their website at ToledoSymphony.com and their various social media outlets on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find the TSO streaming platform online at stream.artstoledo.com. My thanks to Zach Vasser, Merwin Sue, Elaine Trudell, and our special guest Susan Platts. I'm Brad Cresswell. You've been listening to Toledo Symphony Lab from FM 91.